So let's take a look at uh, the last part of section 5.1. So yesterday, the very last thing we did was we converted from polar to rectangular. Um, now we're going to start out uh, by converting the other way. So when you have a point in rectangular, how do you write a coordinate in rectangular? What are the two letters you use? Yep. X and Y. So they're going to give you an X. They're going to give you a Y. And your job is to turn the X and the Y into a what and a what if it's in polar. Radius and Radius and even more general, a degree measures and theta, theta which is the what does theta mean? The angle, right? The angle. So our goal is to turn an x and a y value into a radius and an angle. So I'm going to make a sketch. Um, this point, we'll just call this point x, y. We don't know how far right and how far up it is. Okay. All we know is that, let's put a line in here. Okay. So from here to here, that's your x distance, going to the right, and then from here to here, that's your y distance. So you went right x units, up y units. Okay. First thing we have to figure out is the radius. So if this was on a circle, it would look like that, if that point was right on the edge of the circle. When I draw the radius in from the origin to the top of the green line, what shape am I going to create by doing that? Joe? Triangle. Yep, what kind of triangle? Besides a multicolored triangle. Right. A right triangle, yes. So I just created a right triangle. And that side is the radius, but it's also the what? Slope. Um, well, there's a slope to that radius, which we don't have to worry about what the slope is, but I'm thinking in terms of the triangle, what is that? In terms of the circle, it's the radius, but it's also the yeah, hypotenuse. It's the hypotenuse. So now our goal is going to be to find the hypotenuse of a triangle. And that's how we'll get R. So we'll go through that in a second. Um, what formula could I use as long as I know X and Y, which you will? Yep? The Pythagorean theorem. We can use the Pythagorean theorem. So R is going to be easy to find. Um, what's the other thing I need to find besides R? Yep? The measure of the angle. Measure of the angle between the red side and the black side. Okay, that's theta. Well, you want to find theta, you're going to know x, and you're going to know y. So let's just figure out the names of the two sides, x and y, from the perspective of theta. What's the name of the side that's x? That's right, right next to theta. Yeah? Adjacent. Adjacent. So we're going to be looking for a trig function that has adjacent. And what's the name of the side that's farthest away from y? Uh, farthest away from theta. Yeah. Opposite. Opposite. So we're looking for a trig function that's going to have opposite and adjacent. Uh, there's only one trig function that has those two. Which trig function has opposite and adjacent? It's got tangent. Tangent. So I'm going to write this all out very nice on the next page. But just for a second, I'll show you, and then I'll let you copy down the next page. So you're going to end up writing the tangent equals opposite over adjacent. But the goal is not to find out tangent of theta. You want theta. So how would you get rid of the tangent on the left-hand side? Inverse. Yes, you're going to take inverse tangent. Okay. And again, I'm going to write this all out very nice on the next page. So basically, you get a formula theta equals the inverse tangent of y over x. And how you're going to get r? Pythagorean theorem. Okay. So let me write it out. All right, so the first thing we want to do is graph the point that they give you, the xy point, and determine the quadrant it's in. 
You'll see why that's important in a minute. The quadrant has to do with finding theta. So if you're in quadrants one or four, you do exactly what I just told you on the other page. Theta is the inverse tangent of y over x. Now, when we studied inverse tangent, we learned that whenever you do inverse tangent on the calculator, you always get an answer between two numbers. Not the one and the negative one. That, that was like sine and cosine. Does anybody remember for inverse tangent what two angles the answer was always between? It's kind of like when we had the chart and I said to you there could be more than one answer on that chart. I want you to pick the one between negative this and positive this. Yep? I was thinking of something different. Yep. Negative 90 and 90. Very good. The answer, when you do that formula, is always going to be between negative 90 and 90. Well, there's negative 90. That's the same as 270. Here's positive 90. What two quadrants did I just, just draw in? If I'm always between negative 90 and 90, one and four. I'm always in 1 and 4. Well, that's a problem. What if you have a coordinate over here? Inverse tangent by itself would never give you an answer over here or over here. So if you're in quadrants 2 and 3, we've got to do something. We've got to add something to that formula. Okay. It's not really that much more complicated. We just have to add one thing in front of it. If you're in quadrants two or three and you're using degrees, you would do 180 plus the inverse tangent of y over x. If you're in radians, use the equivalent in radians, pi plus inverse tangent y over x. That's why step one is to figure out your quadrant. You should be able to, actually, you should be able to do step one without even graphing it. Like if I give you a coordinate like negative 3 comma negative 5, you should be able to think in your head, oh, negative 3 is left, negative 5 is down, left and down, that puts me right here. It's quadrant 3. All right, so technically you don't even have to graph it. You just have to figure out the quadrant. Remember, that's 1, 2, 3, and 4. Now, besides being in a quadrant, where else could you be? This doesn't cover everything. This covers if you're in a quadrant, but there's other places you can be. Polar or on the x or y axis? Yes, you could be on the x or y axis. So let's pretend we had a point like, I don't know, up here. Let's label that point. I don't know the y value. It's, it's up. I don't know how much it's up, but it's up. But I do know the x value. What's the x value of that point because it's right on the axis? Zero. It's zero. Well, let's see what happens if you try to plug that into either formula. y is some number, but x is zero. What happens if you plug in x, plug in zero for x in that fraction, or this fraction? Undefined. It's undefined. You can never plug zero into the bottom of a fraction. So that's why these formulas don't work if you're on an axis. So what do you do if you're on an axis? You just have to memorize it's one of those four answers. So if your xy coordinate has a zero in it, either zero comma something or something comma zero, you're either going to be here, 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 or here. So you just have to memorize 0, 90, 180, 270. That's actually the easiest case when you're on an axis. You don't need the inverse tangent or anything like that. So between the two formulas I have here, that covers what's in the quadrants. These four are the possible values if you're on an axis. That covers everything that could ever happen for the angle. Mm -hmm. Why is that one zero and that What's that? Like, you put up there, you said it was zero. Like if it's zero comma y, and then down there you say it's ninety straight up. Um. Well, this is a this is a coordinate. That's an angle. But did it say it'd be zero in the fraction? Or 
Right. If you tried to use this formula to figure out, it would come out undefined. So the formula doesn't work on an axis. It's like, it, don't even try to use the formula because it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Does that answer it? Okay. So yeah, when you're on an axis, just forget about, forget about the two formulas because they, they give you weird results that aren't correct. But they work everywhere else, okay, where they're supposed to, in quadrants. Okay, so then the last thing you have to find, or you could do this first, it doesn't matter, they're totally separate. You have to find the radius. So that's where we use the Pythagorean theorem. R squared equals x squared plus y squared. And that's the same formula no matter what quadrant you're in. That never changes. Okay, so the bottom line is you've got to find R and you've got to find theta. You can do them in either order. One does not depend on the other. Okay, so let's take a look at um, a couple um, examples, and then that'll finish um, this, this part of this. Right, we're going to convert 2, negative 2 to polar. So that's my x. That's my y. Okay, I want to figure out what quadrant I'm in, but I, I just want to do a quick sketch. It doesn't have to be perfect. Um, so what quadrant is that point in? Four. It's in 4. Right two down two, it's somewhere around there. Okay, but the point is it's in quadrant four. All right, so to find theta, what's my formula for theta if I'm in quadrant four? Joe? Inverse tangent of y, uh, y over x. Of y over x. That's not the one where you add 180. Only if you're in quadrants two or three. All right. So if you want to simplify it before you type it in, negative two divided by two is negative one. Okay. So we're doing the inverse tangent of negative one, and that gives me negative 45 degrees. Now, I know there's all kinds of ways to write this answer, right? There's how many basic ways are there to write a coordinate in polar? We went through the, how many yesterday? Four. There's four. We're going to write one. Maybe I'll write one other way, but I'm not going to write every single answer in every single way. Right? But that's one way to write your angle, negative 45. All right. Now we're going to find our radius. So r squared equals x squared plus y squared. Um, so, Christian, 2 squared is going to give me 4, four and negative 2 squared, four. still 4. Some people write 0, that, that's not right. You did it perfect. Negative squared is still positive. Wait, hold on, where you, where you got the negative 45, did you just type the um, tangent negative 1 into the calculator? Inverse tangent of negative yeah. 1. Right. Yep. All right, and now my last step, how do I get r by itself? Take the square root. So r is the square root of 8. But remember, square root of 8, that's one you can simplify. You can think of square root of 8 as 4 times 2. And what's the square root of 4? Two. 2. So without writing your radius as a decimal, that's the exact answer. 2 square roots of 2. If you want it as a decimal, you just type that in, and you'll get about um, 2.82 because the square root of 2 is 1.41. So you double it, 2.82. So there's my radius. And there's my angle. Positive radius, negative angle. Now, what if the answer on the test was positive radius, positive angle? Instead of going this way, how much could I go the other way? to get to the same spot. Yeah. 315. 315. So remember, the quick way to change a negative angle to a positive is to add how much? 360. Add 360. Yeah. So these are two answers that are this, exactly the same thing. Positive, negative. Positive, positive. I could do the negative, negative. And I could do the negative, positive. It's four ways to write it. You only need one, right? You only need one. The only trick is going to be if, if it's a multiple choice question, you don't know which 
choice is going to be listed out of the four. There will only be one correct choice for so, column. So for all, like converting the from rectangular to polar, do you every time have to do the Pythag like whatever it's called, Pythagorean theorem? Pythagorean. Yeah, unless it's on the axis. If you have a point that's on an axis, you don't have to. Yeah, because if it's on an axis, I don't need Pythagorean theorem to figure out how far that is from the origin. I could just count one, two, three, four. All right. So when it's on an axis, you don't. It, it's easier. I mean, you can use Pythagorean theorem on that, but you really could just count. It's only when it's off at an angle you can't count because it's it's the hypotenuse of a of a triangle. So then you need Pythagorean theorem. Mm -hmm. So like that it would be four zero degrees. Um, yes, the coordinate at this point would be four zero degrees. That's one way to write it. Um, does anyone have any questions on how you would write this with a negative radius? If if they asked you to do that on the test. Yeah. Okay. We'll take a quick look at it. Well, as a negative radius, it's got to be this. We just have to figure out the angle. So. If you've got a negative radius, that means you're starting here. Just make a triangle, that'll kind of help me. I know that this angle is a 45. All right. So I have two choices. With a negative radius, I can either go this way, if they want a negative angle, or um, I could go this way, if they want a positive angle, I could pick either way. Um, let's do the positive angle. How far is it from here, which was the negative radius? Excuse me. Oh, thank you. To right here. How far is that? It's 135, because if you went all the way, it would be 180. But you're not. You're stopping 45 short. So that would be 135. That's another way you could write the answer. Okay. If you wanted the last way, you just figure out how far is it from here to here. Well, it's 180 plus 45 more. That's 225, and that's in the clockwise direction. Clockwise is negative. So there are the four ways you could write that answer. I usually stick with positive, positive, because that's, that's the one that I kind of like. All right, so let's take a look at this one. Um, we have a negative x, negative y. Um, just generally, what, what quadrant is that going to be in? Negative, negative. Bottom left. Bottom left, three. and that's three. So we're going to be somewhere over there. So my formula for theta. Let's do this one in degrees again. What's my formula in quadrant three? Yep. Um, I, well, I mean, yeah. No. Wait, so why did you do the angle? We're doing gradients in degrees. Well, I, I said to do it in degrees. I didn't write it in the problem, but I think I, I had said it right before we started. But otherwise, the directions here don't specify. So I, I just, I'd rather do it in degrees. 180 plus. So the inverse tangent of negative 5 over negative 4. And when you type that in, you can just cancel out the negatives. Okay. So it's inverse tangent. Uh, actually, let's type it like this. 180 plus inverse tangent of 5 fourths. Okay. So I'm just going to do this one in decimals. Um, we get 231.34. It's not a nice answer. Um, <coughs> bless you. Uh, it's not a multiple of 30 or 60. So this is one you wouldn't see written with a square root. It, it's just not a nice answer. So 231.34 degrees. Right, so there's our angle. And what's going to be the formula to find my radius? Yep. Um, negative 4 squared over negative 5 squared. Negative 4 squared. That's negative 5 squared. That's going to give me, uh, let's see, 16 plus 
25. 16 and 25 gives me 41. So r is the square root of 41, but since we already rounded the angle to a decimal, we might as well just round everything to decimals. 6.40. So if you wanted to write this as a positive radius, positive angle, the coordinate is 6.40, comma 231.34. As far as the other three ways you could write it, we just went through that in the last problem. So you could, you could figure out all the other ways. Any questions on that one? All right, so that finishes up um, the first part. So we're done with section 5.1. All right, so for now, we're gonna jump over to complex numbers and then tomorrow or the next day, Maybe. You'll see the connection between the two. It depends on whether. Let's see what happens with school. So I'm just going to quickly show you where the kinds of numbers we're studying complex numbers fit in. Um, I'm not going to pretend that you use them in everyday life because uh, complex numbers are not used in everyday life for the average person. Question? Um, it's up to you. I mean, is it what? I mean, I'm going to, oh yeah, we're still going. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, we still got 50 minutes. Yeah, no, it's not that, my lesson's not that short today. Uh, so the simplest kinds of numbers you can have are counting numbers. And counting numbers are used for exactly what it sounds like. When you're counting, um, you start with the number one. You don't include negatives, you don't include fractions. One, two, three. If I was counting, I wouldn't say how many people are there in here. Zero, one, two, three, four. If I start with zero, I'm going to be one short. So when you're counting, you don't start with zero. But when you start doing arithmetic, that's when you run into problems. That's, when, that's why we have to keep inventing new sets of numbers. Um, addition isn't a problem with counting numbers. If you give me a counting number and somebody else gives me another counting number, and I add them together, I'll be fine. The answer will still be a counting number. But what operation do you think I could run into a problem with? Where if I try to do this operation, you give me a counting number, you give me another counting number, and I try to do this to them, I might get something that's different than a counting number. Dividing. Dividing. Um, even simpler than dividing, but we're going to talk about division too. Subtraction. Let's say I want to take a counting number and minus the same counting number. Well, that's a problem. If, you, if all you believe in is counting numbers, the answer to this is undefined. You can't do 2 minus 2. The only way you can do that is if you invent a new number, a number that represents having nothing. And that's what whole numbers do. The only difference between whole numbers and counting numbers is now whole numbers include the number 0. So now you wouldn't have to write undefined. You actually have a way to represent that answer. And the symbol in math looks like a circle. It's a, it's a zero. But we could still have problems, even with just subtraction. Could somebody give me a subtraction problem where you've got a whole number and a whole number, but when you do it, the answer is something different. It's not a, it's not a whole number. Remember, whole numbers, the only difference is now we have the number zero. That's all you get with whole numbers. You don't get anything else. You don't get negatives, you don't get fractions. Yep. Two minus three. Yeah, two minus three. All right? If I gave that to somebody in like kindergarten or first grade, they did put like they you can't do it. You know, I don't know what they'd write. They wouldn't write undefined probably, but did write, you know, question mark. Because you can't take away more than you have. Right? If I'm holding two things and you want to take three, um, good luck. I don't know how you're going to do it. You can't. You can't take away more than I have. So now it starts to get a little bit more theoretical. Okay, The idea of having less than nothing. Um, so we can think of that as like a debt at a bank or a debt on a credit card. You owe someone money. That, that's like having less than nothing. It's worse to owe someone money than it is to just have nothing because right? then you, you're, you're in debt. So the next set of numbers are your integers. And now 
when you do 2 minus 3, we have a way to represent that. And we use a number here, and we put this symbol in front of it. We put a dash in front of it. Okay? The dash means less than nothing. Right? It means negative. So now we can answer the question. But we could still have problems. Um, subtraction would always be OK. You can always subtract any integers, to, and you'll always get an integer. You can add any integers, and you'll get an integer. You can even multiply two integers together, and the answer will always be an integer. But what operation could you do with two integers, and the answer might be something new we haven't even talked about yet? Division. Division. So if you took like 3 divided by 4, well, you're trying to take, that's like if you said, all right, I've got three, you know, I got three things, and I want to divide them to four people. All right, so I got a pen, a marker, and a pencil. And I want to give these out to four people. I can't do that. Right? I can't give three things to four people evenly. So now we have to get into breaking things into pieces, parts. All right? And that's our next set of numbers. And those are called rational numbers. And for most purposes for everyday life, rational numbers are probably as complicated as most people get. Um, if you're measuring um, like a pipe or cutting something, you might cut it to, you know, 12 and a half inches. Or if you're woodworking, you might cut something to like um, 2 and 3 eighths. But that, that's a fraction, and that's, that's about all we need. Uh, if you go to a store, you might buy something that costs $6 and then 53 cents, 53 parts out of 100, right? A fraction more of a dollar. Um, and those are your rationals. So that's why we invent fractions, right? So we can answer problems like that. If you never had to answer a problem like that, there'd be no reason to ever invent a fraction. But those kind of things come up. So we have fractions and decimals, same idea. Beyond that, now we start getting into numbers that are more theoretical, right? Still some uses, but they start to get a little bit more abstract from like the everyday person. Something like that. That can never be written as a fraction. It's impossible. So for some people, especially before rational numbers were really a thing, because they weren't, they weren't always a thing, this idea is kind of weird. How can you have a number that you can't write as a fraction? Isn't there, isn't there some way to do it? Like somehow? Um, and the answer here is no. You could actually prove to someone you could never write that as a fraction. And it's not like we don't have like advanced enough technology to figure it out. No, we never will. It's, it's impossible. It, it cannot be written as a fraction. So if that's impossible to write as a fraction, people like to give names to things. It doesn't fit under any of these names. Well, the opposite of rational, we'll call it that. It's not rational. It's the opposite of it. So does anyone know what that's called? Irrational. Irrational. So irrational are any square roots that aren't perfect squares. Like square root of 4, square root of 9, that's different. We can, we can do that in our head. But square root of 2, square root of 3, square root of 5, square root of 12. Can't take the square root of any of those numbers. Um, pi is an irrational number. And irrational doesn't just mean it goes on forever. Okay? Irrational means you can't write it as a fraction. 1 divided by 3, it goes on forever. But I can write 0.3 repeating as a fraction, because right? there's a pattern to it. So irrational numbers means when you look at the decimal, there's no pattern to it. It goes on forever. And that's, that's pretty much it. So now in Algebra 1, those are the numbers you study. You take all your rationals and irrationals, you put them all together. Those are called real numbers. But with real numbers, we can run into a situation like this, where we have a calculation. There's nothing that exists to represent the answer. So what are we going to invent? We're going to invent negatives. We already did that. We're going to invent zero. We already did that. Fractions. We already did that. We even invented things that aren't fractions. So if you had something like this, the answer to that problem, okay, in Algebra 1, somebody would write, 
find. Okay. In algebra one, we learn you, you cannot take the square root of a negative number. Try it on the calculator. And it doesn't technically tell you you can't take the square root of it. It just says that the answer that you get is not real. The answer that you get doesn't fall in that stuff on the left. Okay? So if we want to be able to do it, basically what I can do is if I change the mode on the calculator from real to imaginary, it's like I just taught the calculator algebra 2. Now it understands other stuff besides just reals. Right? So if I now type the same thing in, it doesn't tell me that it's an error anymore. It gives me an answer, and it basically invented this new thing here called I. Right? And I is imaginary. So the only purpose from our perspective for having I is so that we can answer a question like this. If you say that the square root of negative 4 is undefined, it's because you don't understand that there's something you can write for the answer. Just like if you say 2 minus 2 is undefined. Okay, well that just means you don't understand that there's a number called 0. All right. So it's the same idea. There is a way to write it. It's just whether or not you understand what it is. And it's imaginary. And together you take all your reals and imaginaries, and these are called complex numbers. So complex numbers are kind of the big category and they include everything. Um, someone has asked me, is there anything beyond that? Like is there kinds of numbers that are even like we could still come up with another calculation that you couldn't write the answer to unless you invent something else? Um, I'm not really aware of anything above this. That's, that's pretty much what I know. Yeah. If you divide by zero, is that an imaginary number or no? Um, if you divide by zero, it's just something you're not allowed to do. It's not even an answer. It's just, yeah, it's not even an answer. So, yeah. It's just something you're, you just can't do. So, it doesn't fall into anything here. It falls into the zone of the island of misfit numbers. We'll go with that. <laughs> Kind of like the island of misfit toys. Can I write that on my notes? Um, it's probably not an official math term, so you can you can talk about it with me in here. That's okay. All right. So if you look at the way I wrote it, complex numbers have real parts and imaginary parts, and that's the first thing I want to mention right here. So when we write complex numbers, <clears throat> we like to put them in a certain format. The format that we use is called standard form. This is standard form. Anything that looks like that. A would be a real part. B would be imaginary part. The I is just there to tell you what's in front of it is imaginary. So if you had something like that, 2 plus 3i. In that example, 2 is the real part, 3 is the imaginary part. You don't want to write 3i plus 2. Okay, we want to stick with 2 plus 3i. That's, that's the order we, we go for standard form. So we're kind of using it as like an x variable. How you can't add one plus one x together? Right. It's kind of it's kind of like that. They're not like terms. Like if you had two plus three x, you can't add them together because one of them has a something else with it. But it's a little different. Yes, I know that this i looks like a letter, but in math it's not. We'll talk about what i is in a little bit. Um, if you say that i is a letter, then you're kind of saying this is a letter too. No. In math, that's not a letter. In Greek alphabet, it is. But in math, that symbol stands for 3.14. Okay. Like, you would never write a math problem and use this as a letter. Anywhere, ever. Like, when you have to pick a variable, you wouldn't pick the Greek letter pi as a variable. 
people would be very confused because pi always stands for 3.14. Same with i. If I was doing a problem in math and I had to pick a variable, like say the number of balloons I sold at the store, b would be a good choice for a variable. i would not be a good choice. Not because balloons doesn't begin with i, but if you use i, somebody might look at that and think, wait, are they talking about imaginary numbers? Because i is, I is something special. It stands for something, which I'll, I'll tell you in a second. Okay. But yes, if you kind of think of it, Joe, as, as a letter in terms of rules, it, it'll help things make sense when we do more stuff tomorrow. Now, not every number has to have a real part and an imaginary part. Okay, in Algebra 1, there is no imaginary parts. So if you had something like, like this, 6, if you want to think of, well, what's the imaginary part, you could think of it this way, 0. The real part is 6, the imaginary part is 0. When the imaginary part is 0, you normally don't write it. Okay, students in Algebra 1, I wouldn't see something like that on the test. If I asked them the question, like, solve for x, and x came out to 6. They wouldn't write 6 plus 0i. Okay? It is 6 plus 0i, but we just write it as 6. Okay? So that's, that's, that's a real number, no imaginary part. Here's the opposite. This is where there's no real part. It's just a pure imaginary number. Think of it as like 0 plus 2i. Well, if the real part is 0, you don't need to write it. So all you're left with is just a pure imaginary number, 2i. Yep? So what, what are the numbers you mean? What it, like, what would be the use for this? Yeah. Like an application, real world? Sure. Uh, real world applications for imaginary numbers are pretty advanced. Um, we can Google one and try to look it up. Um, it's nothing that I use in my everyday life. I only use it when I'm explaining the concept. Um, the simplest thing I know of is if I try to take the square root of a negative number, then I need to use a high to do it. Now, when would I be taking the square root of a negative number? Um, that's a harder question to answer. It's tough. The applications are, there's some in electrical. I've looked it up, but every time I look it up, I never quite understand what they're talking about. But there's an application for imaginary numbers in electrical where I just happens to model something that they need in electricity and it does it perfect. But I'm not exactly sure because I'm not super, super good with electricity. So imaginary numbers are only used when you're doing the square root of a negative? That's where, that's where I, that's the simplest way that I know how to use them. When you're taking the square root of a negative. But again, if you're asking me, well, where would that ever come up? Why would you be taking the square root of a negative? Um, that's, a, that's a tough question. The answer is uh, the applications for imaginary numbers are very limited from our perspective. Uh, my guess would be most of the applications would involve calculus as well. So it's, even if I could tell you it, it's probably not something that everyone, even me, would understand. Because I've never, I've never studied that advanced imaginary numbers. So let's look at what it means for two complex numbers to be equal. Okay. With real numbers, it's a simple idea. right? 5 is only the same as 5. 5 equals 5. Well, it's almost as simple, except you have two parts. Your first number has a real part, and it has an imaginary part. Your second number has a real part, and it has an imaginary part. In order for these two complex numbers to be equal, the real part here has to be the same as the real part here, and the imaginary part has to match the imaginary part. So that's what it means for two complex numbers to be equal. A matches C, and B matches D. If you only have part of that, they're not equal. Yeah, Scott? So, like Technically, all 
numbers have the card? Yes. That? We usually just don't write it if it's zero. Yes. So three plus eight i is the same as three plus eight i. Right? If I did something like this, three plus seven i and three plus eight i, you might say, oh, well, part of them matches. Three matches three, so does that mean they're equal? No, only the first part is equal, the second part's not. The whole thing has to be equal. Real part and imaginary. Okay. So any, any question on that? Okay, so any questions on the idea of what it means for complex numbers to be equal? So it's pretty straightforward, nothing too advanced. So the two things we're going to look at with complex numbers today, and, and this is the only application you guys are really going to do of complex numbers, is just arithmetic. Right? Add, subtract, multiply, and divide. And today we're only going to look at add and subtract. So if you want to add complex numbers together, you can kind of think of it as like combining like terms. You can combine the real part with the other real part, and you can combine the imaginary with the other imaginary. Okay. Other than that, you can't combine reals and imaginaries. Like, there is no way to simplify this. 2 plus 3i is just 2 plus 3i. You can't say it's 5. You can't, you can't do that. Right. So what I'm showing here is take the real part plus the other real part, put that in front. Take the imaginary part plus the other imaginary part and put that in front of an I. Okay, you got to make sure you put the I there because if you leave the I off, then the person looking at it wouldn't know that it's imaginary. That's what the I means. Okay, so let's just look at adding adding these up. So 3 plus 8i plus 8 plus 2i. Okay. Dylan, what's the real part of my first complex number? 3. 3? And Oscar, what's the real part of my second complex number? 8. 8. And we can combine them together in the operation they want me to do. I just circle them. They want me to add. 3 plus 8 gives me a real part of 11. All right, and now we'll go through and look at the imaginary part. Um, Ephraim, what's the imaginary part of my first complex number? Uh, eight. Eight. And um, Michael, what's the imaginary part of my second complex number? Two. Two. Combine eight and two using the operation of addition, you get ten. And it's imaginary, so make sure you put an I. So that's our answer. Yes. Any question on that? Uh, I don't yeah. For addition? Uh, somewhere further up, I think. Yeah, right. Uh, so this is. equal if and only if they are equal. Yes. So the question here was not. If the question was, are these two complex numbers equal? The answer would be no. Uh, three is not the same as eight. Eight is not the same as three. <coughs> but the question here wasn't. Are these complex numbers the same? The instruction was add them up. So um, I did ask you a specific question on are they equal? I just showed you an example of two of them that are. So I could make up a question. Are the following uh, complex numbers equal? So you could see something like that. 3 plus 8i, 3 plus 8i. The answer would be they are. Does that make sense? Okay. Other questions on that? Yeah. So it's literally just addition with an i at the end? Yeah, so it's like doing 3 plus 8x and 8 plus 2x. It's, like, it's almost like when you did that in Algebra 1. Yep. But remember, I'm going to explain what i is in a minute. Okay, i looks like a letter, and it is a letter in the English alphabet, but in math, I stands for a number, just like the pi symbol. It is a letter in Greek, but it's not a letter when we use it in math. It stands for 
four. So like, does this hot water would that ever simplify like pi does? Um, no. You leave it just like that. There's no. The only time you have to simplify it is if you've got more eyes. Like if you wrote an answer like this. I would say, well, you've got a 10i and a 3i. You should put those together as 13i. That's the only simplifying you have to do. So your final answer should only have one letter, one i in it. Okay, let's look at this one. Um, when I combine those together, what's my real part? Yep. Seven. Seven. And my imaginary part? Negative 10. And what else do I put with that? Uh, I. Yep. Okay. So 4 plus 3 gives me 7. And then a negative 2 plus a negative 8 gives me negative 10. So it's OK for this number to be negative. It doesn't always have to be a plus here. It could be a minus. And it is this time. And you write it just like that. All right. How about what's my real part um, here? Yep, and when you combine them together, this time with addition, what do you get? Negative 10. Negative 10. So that's my real part. And what about my imaginary part? Negative 4 plus positive 8i. 4i. Positive or negative? Positive. Positive. Positive 4i. Okay. Any questions on addition? Let's look at subtraction. So subtraction is pretty much the same thing, except you want to think of that subtraction as almost like a distributive property. So when you do this, you have A minus the C, and then B minus the D. People forget that you're subtracting both. So to find out the answer to this problem, take the real parts, A and C, and subtract them. Take the imaginary parts, B and D, and subtract them. So it's just subtraction instead of addition. You still put the I on the end, just to let people know that that part's imaginary. OK, let's look at an example. We have a real part of 4, we have a real part of 3, and the directions say subtract. So in your final answer, what would be the real part? 1. 1. Yeah. 1. And now I have a real uh, imaginary part of 12, I have imaginary part of 4, and the directions again are subtract. So what would be my imaginary Eight. part? Yep. Plus or minus? Plus. Plus. So 1 plus 8i. Right. And we'll look at one more with subtraction. And then I'm going to finally tell you what i is. OK, like what, what number does i stand for in math? I'll tell you that. Okay, uh, let's see, what's going to be my um, answer here? Scott? Negative i plus 11i. Um, plus 1i. Plus 1i, yep. Because it's 3 minus e, that's negative 5, and then negative 5 minus minus 6. When you have negative 5 minus a minus, it becomes plus. So it becomes negative 5 plus 6, which is 1i. You don't have to put the 1 in front of the i. You can. But in the book, you probably see it written with just the i. Okay. Questions on? All right. So the last thing we'll end off with is what i equals. So i in math equals the square root of negative 1. And notice the word I used to explain that. I said define. Define means that is the way it is, 
and you can't really prove why. So same if I um, said to you, like in geometry, parallel lines never cross, and you ask me why. Because they don't. That's the way parallel lines, that's the definition of parallel. It just means they don't cross. Right? You can't prove why parallel means they don't cross. That's what it means. It's just the way it is. So same thing here. I equals the square root of negative 1. That's just what it is. There's no proof or reason why. Okay. So at some point, somebody had a problem. They were solving it. They said, wait a minute, square root of negative 1, if I try to do that, I get a non-real answer. All right, I'm going to invent something that everyone's going to use and everyone's going to agree on that it equals. All right, well, we'll just say that it equals i. All right? They could have invented something different. You know, like they invented this little symbol for negatives. They invented this symbol for imaginaries. I mean, they could have invented a, a triangle. And then anytime you see a triangle in front of a number, it means imaginary. But they didn't invent it that way, and I think I, that symbol makes more sense. Right. It's kind of like, well, why use that symbol for a negative? Why use a dash? Oh, somebody thought using a dash in front of a number was a good idea. So the big thing is we all have to agree on the same thing. Once we, once we see a symbol, um, we just have to agree that it all means the same thing. So I means the square root of negative 1. So, this is going to come up a lot tomorrow. I squared. Well, what did we just say I is? I is equal to what number? It's the square root of negative 1. So I squared. I took I and I squared it. What happens when you square and square root something? It cancels. So square and square root cancel out, and what am I left with? I'm left with negative 1. So i squared equals negative 1. That means anytime we do a problem and somehow you get a calculation that has i squared in it, you should always change i squared to negative 1. And I can prove why. I just did. Right. I proved why i squared equals negative 1 by going through the arithmetic and showing you that square and square root cancel. So as long as we all agree on this, which is a definition, we can prove other things based on that definition, like this right here. Um, I mean, you could do i cubed, you could do i to the fourth. Um, i squared is all you really need to know. Right. So when we get into multiplication, that's the first thing we'll we'll see tomorrow. We're going to get a lot of i squareds, and just remember i squared equals negative 1. Okay, um, so the homework uh, tonight uh, is on page 308 and page 560. Page 308, that's the end of what we did with rectangular and polar. 55 to 65 all. And page 560 is um, adding and subtracting complex numbers. That page is very fast. Nine to fourteen all.